Now, something we started this year was myself doing a brief five minute or so talk on some uh, current astronomy topic before the speaker of the night. Tonight I have to open for myself, so I have to, <laughs> it's going to be a smoother transition with a microphone than it normally is, so that's pretty good. So yeah, we'll get to apps, take a look on that sheet you've gotten. If, if you haven't gotten a sheet with the apps on it, um, we have copies back here. The volunteers will make sure you get those when I switch over to that part of the evening. Uh, we also have a link on the main page of the uh, observatory website, starkids.org, where you can get all the information about the, the observatory. You can make reservations for your own events here and things like that. So but there's a link on the front there that you can click and download this handout in color. So, but before that, we're going to talk about uh, this little rumory thing that's rolling around in the news. I think the term is clickbait that uh, has shown up that you see something saying, Pluto is a planet again. You go, oh, really? Mm. So is that true or not? That's what we're going to look at. So Return of the Planet, short story of Pluto and friends. So just a quick background on Pluto. It is the last <clears throat> planet uh, discovered uh, by Clyde Tombaugh, the only planet discovered in the United States by someone in the United States in 1930. So very recent. Um, and everything was happy, everybody was fine. Uh, Clyde Tombaugh passed away. They launched New Horizons mission out to Pluto. And as soon as those two momentous uh, moments happened, Pluto got demoted. Oh no. Uh, so what was going on is 92 we started to find Kuiper belt objects. These are tons of their rocks of various sizes out amongst Pluto's orbit and beyond. Uh, some of these might stretch out a good distance uh, to the nearest star uh, all orbiting our Sun. And that got astronomers concerned. Like, oh boy, there's a lot of things out there. Uh, then uh, Eris came along, and it was smaller than Pluto, ultimately, but more dense, more massive, more rock versus icy stuff than Pluto has. And they realized we're, we're going to start getting planets by the tens uh, as discoveries came in. So the International Astronomical Union, they're in charge of naming everything in space. So um, I, th I think Eris originally was called Xena after the Princess Warrior on TV. And, <laughs> and the astronomers get to, to name the rocks for a while, their own things. We had Santa as one of the objects out there and its moons were two of its elves. Uh, that got axed also by the IAU. They, they didn't go for that. But the IAU said, we're just not going to keep stacking planets up. We're going to come out with a different definition. So in 2006, they said, a planet must orbit around the sun, uh, must be of sufficient size, mass, that it, it is a big technical term, assumes hydrostatic equilibrium, which just means it's heavy enough that if you have a high part, it kind of oozes down and the whole thing kind of becomes roundish. So, and a planet and its satellites must move alone in its orbit. So that means it has to be big enough that it's gobbled up all the rocks around it. So, <clears throat> so that changed some of these bodies into dwarf planets. Ceres, the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Pluto, Kuiper belt objects, Haumea, Makemake, Iris, I'm sorry, Eris itself. And then others have proposed additional Kuiper belt objects to be call, called uh, dwarf planets, Orcus and Koar and Sedna and a few of these don't have names yet. And you can see Pluto in the upper left here. There's Eris kind of upper right, Sedna in the far right. And these others are pretty big. Uh, they're around the size of Pluto's moon Charon. 
So the, uh, other astronomers have objections to all this, saying, well, Pluto is large enough to be round on its own, and it orbits the sun. Um, its orbit isn't too weird. It's tilted a little bit and a little um, less round than the other planets. And, but sometimes it comes closer to the sun than Neptune. So Neptune is a planet. It has its own moons, five uh, that we know of. Um, and now that New Horizons mission has made it out there, there's a lot of cool geology going on on the surface of Pluto. And if you're talking about clearing its orbit, uh, Jupiter has Trojan Greek and Hilda's asteroids. And Earth, Mars, and Neptune also have asteroids that do complex dances around in their orbit. So you can see here the Trojans and the Greeks, they're being kept far apart from each other by Jupiter because they don't get along. Uh, and you got lots of little things in, in, in here. So these are big planets and they haven't really cleaned out their orbit. So it's been reproposed that Pluto be turned back into a planet by these uh, astronomers. Kirby Runyon is the person at John Hopkins who wrote the paper and presented a big uh, poster session on it. Alan Stern, who is the head of the New Horizons mission and folks at big observatories and universities around the nation. And they have their definition of what a planet should be. Uh, they say really the pro property of what's a planet needs to be defined by the body itself and not the environment that it happens to be in in space. So they say a better definition is it's substellar, so it's smaller than a star, uh, a body that has never undergone nuclear fusion, so it's not even something big enough that was briefly considered a star, has enough gravity to maintain a roughly round shape. If it's got that, that's good enough to be a planet. And bingo, you're going to have to learn 110 objects that we know of now that are in the uh, uh, planet mode in our solar system. And Europa, our moon, would be even added. So we'd be Earth and the sister planet, the moon. Kind of cool. Yeah. That would be, a, yeah, a binary planet system would be what they're proposing. So... Just recently, planet Didi, that's not the official name, it hasn't been officially named yet. I'm sure that's uh, an astronomer's wife, um, I don't really know. <laughs> uh, but Didi is not too much smaller than Pluto, but it's in a round shape, and it's the smallest thing, 635 kilometers, so that's what, about 400 miles in diameter, pretty small. And its orbit is huge, going way out here beyond Pluto's. So, looking as best I could, the, the IAU is completely silent about listening to this proposal and considering it. So, stay tuned. Uh, Physics.org, if you go there, you can search for Pluto as a planet and see what they've got. So, it's possible. Astronomers are pushing towards it, but there's no scheduled hearing for Pluto yet. All right, any questions on Pluto? And, other planets. Yes. I think that's right. Yeah. And they did this proposal in August, uh, April. April. So they, they are, they're getting the wheels going. Um, the way it kind of looks to me, you know, people will go, oh, the moon and Europa, a moon of Jupiter. Maybe they're trying to bend the argument so far this way that when it kind of relaxes back, we scoop up the dwarf planets and call them planets. And maybe we jump up to 20 or something. Yeah, planets. And that'd be easier to learn for your test, right? <laughs> Question. So I went to the Desert Museum and I was talking to a man who worked there, a volunteer, and he said that when I did the proposal for to, um, the, the Pluto to not be a planet anymore, most of the people who wanted Pluto to be a planet had left already. So it was sort of. Oh, like, yeah, yep. There, there was a lot of controversy about how the meeting actually happened at the very end of that meeting. Um, not really behind closed doors, but yeah, it was kind of like, hey, let's, we got a room over here, let's kind of, yeah. And that's the way it's rumored to have gone, but very good point. What, what motivates the desire to change the status? Is it because scientific data is changing, um, new knowledge is coming in, or somebody just wants to 
shake things up? Right. They, they wanted to make a distinction between planet and things that are smaller rocks. And they felt that, that just adding that many planets, 100 planets maybe, or more, maybe 20 years from now we're up to 500 as telescopes get better and, and we, we develop better observational techniques. I mean, once we get um, the next big space telescope, what is it? James Webb, thank you, it's just gone for me. Uh, James Webb, up, it's going to operate in the infrared. It's going to see the heat signatures of lots of these bodies. So they, they felt they needed to cut it off at more of a traditional solar system size. Um, but yeah, it, it seemed a little arbitrary. Yeah. But then if you just say Pluto is back in because we like Pluto, that's kind of arbitrary too. <laughs> so. Yes? Now, the, the, the originally yeah. ancient ob observed planet, so it's Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, right? If they had really good eyesight and kept really good records, they could have gotten Uranus, but because it is just barely visible. But yeah, that's, uh, you, I guess you'd call them classical planets, maybe? I think I've heard a term like that. That's good. I guess, guess up to the teacher. There you go. Cl classical planets up to middle school, and then 110 for high school. Yeah. All right, yes? So if there was a large asteroid that was round and orbited the sun, would it be considered a planet? Under this new definition, yes. Ceres is one, yeah. And Vesta is another one that's got lots of interesting geology. It's round. It's in the asteroid belt. Oh, it wasn't even on this list here. Yeah. Yes? Um, I don't know if you already talked about this time, but uh, with all these new definitions for planets, when will we be hard to find moons from planets? They're saying there doesn't need to be a moon distinction. If it's round, it's a planet. Yeah, if it's round, if it's big enough to have done that under its own gravity, uh, but then you got things that are largely slush balls that can be very small, but because they're made of such malleable materials, they'll assume a round shape when they're very tiny. And you got things that are big and solid that might be kind of potato shaped, uh, uh, larger. So it's, yeah, you get weird things like that that happen. So yes? Our By this, this new proposal, if that there went are through. Right. And poets and <laughs> Blue planet, la 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 la. I see a bad planet rising. <laughs> yes. Isn't there, uh, I'm not familiar, but isn't there, like with our moon, it has a very special relationship to Earth mm -hmm. uh, such that it doesn't seem like it's simply uh, just another planet. You know what I mean? I don't know. I know. Like it would be helpful to have that distinction. But I don't know if like if other moons have like Jupiter's moons probably don't contribute a significant amount to what happens on Jupiter or does it? Do they? Mm, yeah, gravitationally, they, the Jupiter d d works them over hard, but yeah, not probably not in reverse very much. That's that's true. Oh, we got Pluto itself is almost a, is definitely a double planet. The uh, point that they orbit is outside of the surface of Pluto because they're so close to being. Uh, similar in size, so yeah. Here, the our moon's center of rotation, the Earth-Moon system, is still underneath the earth, crust of the Earth, but it's not at the center of the Earth. It's towards the moon. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I guess I would have to emerge out of the discussions, yeah. Uh, they don't make any distinction. Yeah. So, for now, Pluto's still demoted. I, I, I have a t-shirt my dad sent me for Christmas that says, back in my days there were nine planets. And so, so, yeah. you can get off my lawn. So, all, right. all right, so let's switch over now to apps. So get out your little app sheet. I'm going to be working from the back behind you on an iPhone. Um, I chose to do the phone instead of a pad because more people have phones than pads. So I'll show you how 
uh, some of these apps look in the phone <coughs> format. It'll all be up on the screen in front here. Um, I'll show you eclipse things and show you weather forecasting things for the eclipse. But the weather forecasting is good for any astronomical or even any outdoor activities you want to do. And then I'll show some of the uh, astronomy planetary, uh, planetarium style apps and some of the information apps that are out there. So again, at the end I'll open it up for suggestions and I'll demonstrate what I can on, on different apps there. So let me switch to the, uh, the back. And if we have time, maybe I'll even take some shout outs for forecasts for uh, different locations. We'll see how fast the internet works. Does everybody have a handout? But you can still hear me, and you'll see what I'm doing up in the front. And since we're, we're, my wife and I are getting ready to take a two-year-old and an eight-year-old up to Lusk, Wyoming, to possibly be among millions of crazy people looking at this eclipse, you could see embarrassing texts appear at the top, so I apologize. <laughs> Do you know where the diapers are? <laughs> Actually, I don't. I, I, that's, that's the answer. I don't know where. All right, so I'm going to start here under Eclipse, Eclipses. And the app that I w have been using for the longest time is a little clunky, but this one is just called Eclipses. And that's the top one under Eclipse Aids on your handout. Um, the little strobing circle in the upper left is locating me right here in Berthoud. But if I tap that, um, I don't know what dash bar means, but it means I can move the map around to any place I want now. And so zooming out, um, I can see the path of totality up across um, Wyoming and Nebraska. And I can take my little location pin and at 94% here and go up to say, uh, this location. Let's zoom in a little near Guernsey State Park. And here it instantly tells me that at this location I'll have 2 minutes and 13 seconds of totality. And if I hit details at the bottom, it just has a nice tabulation of information from sunrise, sunset, Start of the partial, start of the total, maximum, and total, and partial. Gives you your altitude, latitude, and longitude at that point. Uh, population um, is 143,000. It must be the county. That's four oh, is it four counts? It's doing based on that. Okay. And what's nice about this, come on. Of course, not nice if it does that. If you go into details where you saw that, if you pick the local date, then you can get a listing of all the future lunar and solar, including partial solar, annular eclipses off into the future. So you can hop to any of those, see their path, and work with them like you were working with this one. So, nice quick reference, gives you past and future, and go all the way back to the 2000s and take a look at eclipses in 2000 on the app Eclipses. Pretty straightforward. Eclipse 2017 by the Smithsonian. This is the third one down. Got a countdown here. This is the first contact on the shore of Oregon. There are cruise ships that will be out in the Pacific and the Atlantic uh, catching these eclipses as well, I've heard. But on land, this is the first point. You can get recent views of the sun. Uh, so here you can look at the sun in different wavelengths and see what uh, type of sunspot activity is going on. A lot of this information is a little more technical than your average user is going to find. So, but what's neat is they do have a link to the Eclipse live stream at the top. So if you hit that, I don't know if it'll do anything now, 
That should take you to your viewing options. Yeah, it's not live yet. Uh, on the day of the eclipse, NASA's streaming coverage across the nation as the eclipse goes. You can take a look at an interactive map. And it, yeah, it wants to use my current location. Very similar to the other. You can zoom on in to a location or you find your location by your GPS. You can double click and it should, yeah, there it is, calculating the partial, total, maximum, and total and, and partial for whatever location you're in, whatever location you tap at that you plan to drive to, traffic permitting. But it's a rest area. It's a rest area, okay. All right, well, maybe that's a good spot. So that is kind of all the tricks of Eclipse viewing and safety guide. I try to do the free downloads and basically they're asking you to subscribe to their uh, email newsletter and I didn't end up finding any, where the downloads were, so a little clunky on their part. And they have a central button for the observatory itself, but unless you're interested in the observatory, that won't work for you now. So that's Eclipse 2017. Eclipse Safari again has an interactive map and this is very similar to all the others. You can zoom in around, tap it and get, so there's Berthed, shows maximum eclipse 11, 46 and 44 seconds AM. And if you click view though, with the Sky Safari engine inside, you'll get a view of the sky at that point. All depending apparently on your internet connection speed. <laughs> there we go, so there's the sun and moon right next to the star Regulus. So if you look back over here to your, over your right shoulder to the wall, the sun will be right about here, uh, next to Leo the lion right between Cancer and Leo. So these are the stars you'll see around uh, the sun and moon uh, during maximum eclipse if you're in the path of totality. And everybody does, has surely by now heard every safety talk possible, but unless you're under the path where totality will occur, there's no point you can look up the sky or use any optical aid to look at the sky. You, you have to use the sunglasses that are approved for solar viewing. Uh, or certain grades of welder's goggles, make sure you have the correct numbers like that. So, but you can, in this app, you can zoom out, see the horizon. You can see Venus will be to the upper right, distant upper right. Mars will be to the nearby upper right. Mercury will be to the lower left. And Jupiter way down on the eastern horizon uh, during mid eclipse. And you can zoom and time back and forth, kind of fun. So that's Eclipse Safari. Now that's part of Sky Safari Pro, and I'm gonna demonstrate that a little bit later after we're done with Eclipse and Eclipse weather <laughs> stuff. That is simply the best program, period, on iPhone, iPad, uh, and probably Android too. I... Yeah, oh, and so I was telling John, yeah. I just downloaded that, and uh, I think it was free. Yeah, this, the Sky, uh, Sky Safari is free. And when I did that, then they instantly gave me an opportunity to buy the Pro version for like 19 20 yeah. yeah. Normally $40. When, so when, yeah, when holidays like Christmas come along or big astronomical events come along, they cut their price in half on Sky Safari Pro 5. So this is the time to pull the trigger if you like the demonstration a little bit later. Totality is by Big Kid Science. And it uh, has a neat little nearest, oh, it doesn't crash. So start, and it's got the same map, it's loading. If you click nearest totality, well, it crashes, okay. That's not good. Maybe it's because the map hasn't loaded. But it does pick a point in Nebraska as being the closest point, not Wyoming. Uh, because the eclipse's path is definitely curving to the southeast. No, this one just doesn't want to do it. Maybe their servers are starting to get overloaded already. Yeah, if you're making an app for an eclipse, you probably should really stress test your 
your servers before the, the event. It's okay, there's no internet connection. Yeah, there won't be any internet, yeah. Yeah, and let me go ahead and do that little spiel. That if you do plan to go up into the path of totality by car, um, you really have to go as self-contained as possible. You have to expect cell phones and data and connections will not work up there just because of the sheer number of people trying to get on those very few small powered uh, cell towers. Gas stations are going to run out of gas. Food is going to run out fast in restaurants and grocery stores. Uh, we're bringing a whole bunch of rolls of toilet paper so we can give away some as well. So, because even if you do stop at a gas station and use the restroom, there won't be paper eventually. Uh, we're talking 10 times, 100 times of the people flow that these places have ever had. Uh, we're taking water, we're taking uh, plates and silverware and food so we can make it in the hotel room. We are trying to dry camp basically in a hotel because we just don't think that the uh, infrastructure of any of these little towns is going to be able to take this. So, and this would be Glendo gas station, which is the only one between Cheyenne and Wheatland, ran out of gas for the 4th of July weekend. Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, I used to work for a Yep. And the, I got interviewed by the uh, Denver Post, and the cameraman said that a friend of his works for Cisco, which is a food delivery, uh, nationwide big food delivery thing. They have already decided to stop delivering food into the Eclipse Path starting tomorrow morning because they don't want their trucks with food on it stuck in traffic. So there's not going to even be new food coming in to the path for two or three days. So. Take your food. <laughs> All right. Eclipse 2017 org. Has you select your location. Oh, that's not nice. If, if, if at first you tap a button and it doesn't work, keep hitting. Uh, so here, this Eclipse2017.org, not to be confused with the Smithsonian one, has a map also, and you can click on locations and sample, but it, it generates a neat little uh, first touch, last touch, and maximum look. So that's how much the uh, sun will be peeking past the moon here in Berthoud at 11.46.45. And they say there's going to be more functionality that comes in to uh, be on this app during the eclipse. Uh, so I, but there's no way to simulate it, so I, I can't show you what it is. I don't even know what it's going to do. So I'm probably not going to be relying on that app. Uh, if you want to see it, um, again, no data. Expect no data or no Wi-Fi or anything, even in hotels up in the path of totality, just because the region won't be able to support that much data. But NASA television, and here's a view from the International Space Station, they're going to be doing coverage here. And the NASA TV app will be doing that. The NASA app itself, um, don't want that. Uh, we'll have coverage as well and news stories and all sorts of things on the NASA app. All right, so that's a quick rundown of those. I'm saved solar eclipse timer for last because this is the one that I actually plan to use during the eclipse. It looks pretty good. It's got some extra bells and whistles here. I got to turn the sound up. So here we have local time. And totality duration here is zero. You can pick your own location and see it beforehand. But uh, what this does is it has a little movie that it plays that it syncs up with the actual uh, sun moon geometry during the eclipse and it verbally narrates what's going on with the eclipse and tells you when it's safe to take the glasses off and when you need to count down to put the glasses back on. So here it's making a simulation of what the sun will look at like at this location at maximum eclipse. That's a little sliver, that's 95%. If you go to settings, you can play a practice movie. So let's just do that and listen. It takes about 30 seconds to a minute to get to the first exciting things. But 
So totality duration is simulated to be two minutes. And it was quiet for a while there. So it's got first contact, second contact, maximum eclipse. I guess we have to wait one minute. And there's no way for me to speed this up. So any, until it talks, does anybody have any quick questions about the eclipse or getting to the eclipse? I'm going to show traffic in just a little bit as long with, along with weather for, uh, data. Oh. Call me is not the biggest thing. Well, I want to say fans, for lack of a better word. I mean, I think this is so exciting. Mm -hmm. But is it really worth it for total eclipse versus, what, 96% here or something like that? I mean, it's a difference between day and night, literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really is. The, the real event is totality. Yeah. Well, this is the first time since what, the 70, 79? 79 on the mainland, 91 uh, total eclipse went over uh, Hawaii. 1918 since when we went all the way across. 99 yeah. commercial. It's not, yeah, we're not hearing it. Doggone you. We, we tested the audio before and it played it, but it's, it decided not to this time. So yeah, it goes um, uh, second contact, five, four, three, two, one, um, total eclipse, and it says take glasses off. On the other side of it, it says take glasses off, 15, 14, does a big countdown, and so it, it does describe stuff. Yeah, technology, what are you going to do? So this, this looks like a really good app to have running, and it, it will time to your, uh, your exact location and do this. Yes? So what does it mean like after the first contact? Is it like second contact and the third? What does that mean? Uh, the first contact is the first touching of the moon on the edge of the sun for the first little bite. Second contact is the beginning of the total eclipse. Third contact is the end of the total. Fourth is when the last nip vanishes off of the sun. Yeah. All right, so that's the one I, I recommend you get. Uh, it's two dollars, and I'm not getting any cut of that. So. <laughs> the 2017 Eclipse.org has a three dollar in-app purchase to unlock all of its functionality, but again, once I did that, I couldn't tell what it's gonna do. It just says it's gonna do great things during the eclipse. Can't test it till the eclipse happens, so. All right. As I have on here, there are lots of different ways NASA is doing it. Um, their video stream, it's going through live stream, Facebook Live, off of YouTube, Twitter and Periscope, Twitch TV, Ustream, and through the NASA apps. So and you can just, on a computer, go to nasa.gov and get it on, off of any browser. So there's a lot of different ways it's doing it. I think TV stations are going to be showing it too from the NASA stream. So it, uh, there's lots of ways to do that. So let's move on from eclipses to forecasting. You don't want to do all this effort and get up there and get clouded out. So weather forecasting for astronomy is the next one down. Uh, section down on my handout here. Observer Pro is the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th one down. It's a great planning program. You can bring up Messier, Caldwell, Herschel catalogs. You can look to see optimal times to look at things in your telescope and you can plan a whole night observing. So it's got lots of other functions in addition to, to this. This is a $14 program. Um, really pretty feature packed for astronomers. But you go in and you set your sights. So where I'm going is Lusk, Wyoming. I've got Alliance on here also. And if you go to weather on the bottom, it goes to a website that you can visit on any browser called Seven Timer. This is actually a weather forecast product made in China. And it was down for winter and spring. Uh, nothing, you, you wouldn't get anything from their site. Then it came back up a month and a half, two months ago, but the little blue circles are the percent cloud cover locally, and that's what you're really interested in, and they weren't filled in until just a week ago. So it's working now in time for the eclipse. 
There's the 21st over the very end, and noon is the very farthest out point that is right now forecasting for, and it shows where I'm going uh, will be clear. Uh, the little lightning bolts at the bottom tell you how unstable the air is, so there are thunderstorms expected in the afternoon. Uh, if I go to sites like Alliance, where a number of people hoping to go, it's actually working really well. It shows it being very cloudy after midnight. That's that last red vertical red bar with a 21 on the left and a zero, zero on the right. That's, that's the midnight line. And then 3 a.m., 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, very cloudy pre-dawn, totally overcast. And then kind of breaking up and then clouding up again around noon. So very unstable atmosphere again. Lots of, lots of these little lightning bolts down the bottom. So that's a good way to get to a seven timer. But if you just search for a seven timer, you can make a shortcut to their site uh, in your browser. So this is just the browser on the, um, on the phone. And this is all based on how fast the internet connection will work for us. But it's gonna show the same little weather forecast. And you can go in and put any location that you're at and get the same data. Come on. Okay, I don't want to make your way here, but you can do that when you have a better connection. I don't know, it's five megabytes per second. It should be pretty good. All right, another good one is clear sky charts. This is another one that you can get to through a web browser, and you can make a shortcut on your desktop to that, or you can get the clear sky ch clock app for $2, and you can stack up five locations. I have a cabin in Camp Creek, Arizona, so I, I requested an uh, oh, earthquake in Fiji. All right, a uh, little uh, short attention span on my part. Uh, so that's my observatory, which is just a rock platform in Arizona. Um, here in Longmont, you can go to detailed chart, and it's sideways, <laughs> and it only goes out to Sunday noon. So. That one's not ready yet to show us anything about the eclipse, but give it a day, and this one will be making forecasts out. They look very similar. Let me see if I can get to, to their site. Here we go. That was quick. So here's their site showing cloud cover and how transparent the air is, and you can go along. This only goes to Sunday. Now what's really neat is if you tap on one of those squares, like Sunday at 6 a.m., it will show you a computer-generated future satellite image if it decides to load. Maybe, yeah. Only, some things are working quickly. But you get, this will show an entire map of the U.S. That little plus sign is Longmont, Colorado. And you'll see blues for clear skies where you're seeing the ground from space and whites where the clouds are. But it doesn't want to load, does it? So again, you can do this with a, without buying the $3 app. You can just make this a shortcut uh, on your device. Yeah, and it can't, doesn't let you do that. All right, Scope Nights is a $5 app using a uh, United States model. I think it's the GFS to forecast. And here it is looking for Longmont. And it's trying to update the stargazing forecast. Um, similarly, you get another opinion. So here is Monday, and Monday from uh, up to 6 a.m. shows partly cloudy skies. It, it doesn't want to do it at the daytime, so it's doing nighttime forecasts only. So it's not too excited about cl the cloud prospects here on the front range, at least up to sunrise. All right, so those are the, the main ones, there's some others you can play with, like uh, Clear Outside, Skippy Sky is out of Australia, but they, their forecast actually does uh, cover, make future cloud maps for the United States. And Minge Hemel, I think is in a Dutch app, so you, you can't read anything unless you speak that. But uh, you can get your current location and it's pretty um, obvious uh, what it's telling you. Wolkenwurfspieling? Hmm? 
It says cloud forecast, okay. There we go. I can't read that, no. So there's Saturday, there's up to Monday at noon. Uh, be woke it? <laughs> Cloudy. Cloudy, okay. <laughs> 80, 69 to 81% cloud cover. So it's another opinion. Cloud forecasting and computers is pretty new. Uh, and it's not horribly well tested and refined because not too many people need it until a big eclipse comes along. So. All right. How are we doing on time? We're getting close. All right, so any questions about weather forecasting? I'm going to do traffic next. So I don't know if, how many people have ever done this, but if you look at Google Maps or the map app that's default, which is TomTom Tom with um, uh, the Apple device, if you zoom in on roads, you can see traffic. They got Spartan Avenue has a backup. It looks really bad. Uh, <laughs> and then there's green going both ways. So, yeah, it must be everybody trying to get to this talk. They're just backed up outside right now. Uh, but you can zoom out and move over to the interstates and start to see traffic. Um, and I will be doing this the moment I wake up tomorrow morning as we finish packing the car and looking at Interstate 25 and tracking my way on up to Cheyenne. Oh, there's some road closure there. I don't know where that was. Oh, there we go. We got some loops closed, so don't take those in Cheyenne. And it, uh, I'll be heading off on 85 after that. But hey, right now, no traffic. Now, coming up here tonight, I was heading up through central Longmont, and it was taking me three times to get through a light. And like, oh, no, everybody's heading for Wyoming already. That's just standard Friday. That's just standard Friday. They're going to, going to Papa John's, yeah. Or, or Papa Murphy's, that's it, Papa Murphy's, yeah. So that's one great way. Now, my favorite navigational tool is Waze. This is running off of the same Google data because Google absorbed them as Google will. And you can put things in like Lusk. And what this has the same routing, but it has only 173 miles. Um, and it can help me park in Lusk, which may become important. Uh, but this takes in reports from other users and watches users using the app and they, sees when they slow down and it starts feeding that information into calculating your route to where you want to go. And so it's not getting the GPS here, but to get to Lusk right now, it's just taking me over to I-25 and on up. And you can see um, construction there. Oh, there's a car stopped near John, Johnstown right now. There's two, two reports of a car stopped there near Loveland. And it will route you around things. It is sometimes taking me through bizarre country fields around big backups on 25 and I've only lost a couple minutes instead of being stuck. Um, the problem with this is it does need the internet to do all this. And up in the path of totality, if things lock down, then you're not going to have that type of information. So what you need to do then is go back to Google Maps and before you ever leave, hit the little bars in the upper left. You can see I've been going to California Pizza, chicken, and noodles recently. Um, and go to offline areas. And offline areas will download base maps um, and store it for, I think it's a month, which you got plenty of time. Go to custom area at the bottom and then highlight everything around where you're trying to go. There's Torrington, there's Lusk. You can kind of zoom out and hit download. This says it's going to be big. Um, it may take 20 minutes, maybe take an hour for it to download all that data. And it's going to take a big gigabyte or more out on your phone. But you're going to have the data when the internet's gone. And it will route you around. It won't give you traffic information, but if you hit a complete 
standstill and you just decide to head east and try to arc around the interstate, this will at least continue to give you routes through uh, Farmer Smith's front yard. So, <laughs> so that, yeah, those are my planned tools for getting around traffic and clouds for the eclipse. Any questions? Why not paper state map at the info center? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at just a few uh, cool astronomy apps. Uh, I'll show the Sky Safari Pro that's right now half price at $20. Um, that's, uh, it may be the most expensive app you ever get, but if you like astronomy, there is nothing that this thing can't do, and it does it beautifully. So, and again, I'm not getting a cut of that. So here I've got set for where I'm going, Lusk. This is at 11.37 uh, a.m. on Monday. You can zoom in and see uh, what's happening on the sun-moon combination there. And I can zoom back out with just by pinching fingers. And I can set it, you can underline seconds, minutes, hours, years. You can go centuries in, in an instant, forward and back in time. I'm just going to go seconds and watch the um, sun co get covered by the moon and out come some stars and I can pause and you can see Venus now upper right Mars Mercury down below Jupiter way over here near Spica rising in the east in the western sky you've got Sirius on the lower um, center left of the image here. Orion, everybody's favorite winter constellation, is, is down in the southwest, west southwest sky. So hopefully you'll see some of this. I do think that getting a few clouds, little puffy clouds in the sky makes it more picturesque. They turn dark as well and it looks great. So I just don't want anything to mess up the eclipse for anybody. All right, and I can continue to advance the Time sped up here. You can see seconds racing by, and we're back into the light again. And this thing really does everything possible. You can search for moons, planets, satellites, double stars, and things like that. Um, you can click on something like Venus. You can center Venus, and you can go to Venus. And I go, I know I think it's just a double click. There we go. I can orbit <laughs> Venus. And away I go out into space to, to go to Venus. And I can look back and find the Earth. There's the Sun, Mercury, there's Earth from Venus. Earth, oh, Pluto is just behind Earth tonight. I, I think that's romantic, but I'm not really sure. Uh, I can go to Rigel Cantaris and I can click that and orbit and go to another star. So this thing can take you to all the other planets and they, it has their geology and uh, terminology all correct. Rigel Cantaris is a double star system. So you can go around that and have the other star go around. You can find the sun, you can say uh, sun and planets, sun, center the sun, and it'll show you from Rigel Cantaris, there's where the stars behind Rigel Cantaris look like. And I can go to settings, and I can say constellations. I want to show the constellations, and so it is in, let's see. It's, everything's a little warped and bent. I think I better get constellation names up here. So show me, show names. So it's, the uh, sun is in Perseus, near Perseus and Camelopardalus from Rigel Cantaris, which makes sense because it's in our southern sky. So you can go to comets and see comets go around and downloads comets data live. So if you go to, um, a solar system, go down to the bottom, you can update the minor bodies. So all the asteroids, moons, comets, and uh, 
Oh, another, another earthquake. Oh, the earthquake in Fiji again. It's shaking in Fiji tonight. Yeah. And then you click Earth to go back home. So let's zoom home. Yeah, here comes Earth. Boom. All right. <laughs> we are back, back in where everybody should be, Lusk, Wyoming. <laughs> oh, hey. Uh, the Eclipse app is over on the lower right. They actually built that into the latest update of this. So you don't have to download that as a separate app. It also has Sky and Telescope's week uh, app incorporated into it so you can see upcoming astronomical events like the Perseids are taping down, ta tapering down on August 13th. In the early dawn on uh, 15th you could look uh, east for the waning moon in Aldebaran. Um, and if you click view on one of these it'll show you a simulation of the sky for whatever that interesting event is. So you'll, it kind of teaches you as you go. It can also do the compass thing where you move your phone around and it shows you what's in the sky behind your phone. So you can say, what is that bright thing up there? And you can point your phone at it, get it centered and see what the name is. So that's the compass function. If you have a telescope, it, hmm? this is Sky Safari Pro 5, currently for $20. Uh, before the thing. If you hit scope, you can set it up uh, with a Bluetooth adapter to modern scopes or buy an adapter for your scope. You can control your telescope from this app. Tap on an object that your telescope will slew over to it. So pretty, pretty neat. So there's tons of other apps similar to that. I'm not going to spend time looking through all those. Are there any questions or any requests that anybody sees? There's ones here that show you all the upcoming meteor showers, ones that show you the aurora, ones that help you find the International Space Station, ones that show you Jupiter and Saturn's moons tonight, moon globes like this, show you a high definition defini image of the moon. You can go around, look at the back side of the moon here. So any questions or any requests? Yes? How much memory do all these apps take on Sky Safari Pro is the biggest of all of them, and so and that's, it's worth the big bucks. It takes about a gig and a half. So, yeah, that's, that's hefty, but phones are coming out now with 128, 256 gig if you go for the higher end. So. Which free planetarium program do you recommend? The one that I recommend the, the best that is free, let me go over to it. Stellarium is very good. Um, I think uh, Skyview is really good and Starwalk to Skyview. Oh, told us, yeah, no kidding. There's an eclipse coming. I missed it. Oh. So this one shows you guys and overlays in an augmented reality version. So that, that's got a nice free version that does that. Uh, Stellarium is a really good one. I don't know if it supports, yeah, horizon mode here. So there's horizon mode, and you can, very, very highly customizable. You can turn constellations on and off. You can bring up all the mythological artwork for constellations. So that is, this, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, is it? Come on, John. That's Stellarium. Yeah, I forgot. I'm, I was holding this one vertical, and you can do Sky Safari Pro horizontal as well, and it looks, looks nice. A lot of these do tilt that way. So yeah, I would go um, Skyview, Starwalk 2, or Stellarium. Question? question? Yes. So if you got all these apps that you said that Sky Safari Pro could do because I, I, yeah, I, to be able to show you, and so I could evaluate them all. When I first got an iPhone, and I won't tell you what version, uh, I could find nothing out there of anybody's favorite list. Like, well, this one's $2, this one's $5, this one's 30 What am I going to do? And so I decided to do it all and inform the world. Thank you. You got it. Yes. 
Yeah, I like it so much I kept the previous two versions. Because, <laughs> yeah, they're, what I do is I save other simulations there in there to show people. So I can go to a different eclipse and, and look at But these do allow you to save things. So I could set, in Sky Safari, you can go into settings, go down to save and restore. You can create uh, a date and a time and event, name it yourself, and then go right back to it. So like I was in New Zealand on the South Island. So I can go view, uh, view settings. Down. I can apply the settings and it re takes me back in time. Oh no, it didn't. It's here. It's, it's 2017. That takes me back in space to where I was then and looking at the uh, southern sky in a, in a quick wink. All right, other questions? Let's see if Seven Timer decides to come up on a web page. All right, anything else? Anybody? Let's see, deep, deep, DS browser allows you to see a huge catalog of things. Meteor guide also shows you uh, all the meteor showers coming up. There's, there's an app for everything. Pluto Safari was made by the same folks and it gave you information that was Pluto went through. And it's going to show what uh, New Horizons mission is doing as it gets to its next object. A galaxy collider lets you crash galaxies together for fun. So you see how they gravitationally interact. So, this will be, this is uh, birthed in five billion years. <laughs> The date of the first recorded, uh, recorded uh, eclipse. I think there's records from Chinese astronomers going far back in the BC years. But yeah, I, I don't have a more specific answer than that. And I'm getting shrugs from the volunteers. I'll have to Google that. <laughs> oh, look at that. I actually have a, a shortcut to starkids.org. I don't know why I'm not getting websites. <laughs> well, we got a nice connection. Oh, there we go. Yay. Oh, <laughs> but it's geared for your volunteer in heart. So there's, oh, there's, there's the Eclipse app. Yay. That should look familiar. All right, if there are no other questions, what do we have in the telescopes? It's getting really cloudy. Really cloudy? Okay, let's get the clouds over now. We won't have to have them on Monday. Yeah, all right, thank you very much.